Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks for coming along to this talk. Um, I won't be doing any dancing. I'm going to leave that one to Andy, uh, who's now a resident dancer. Um, so what I want to talk about today is obviously we're all at this conference, and if you've been to any of the sessions so far, you've heard about the importance of open source, how pivotal it is to everybody's lives. We use it at home, we use it at work, our governments use it, everyone uses it. When we get to that point, obviously, here in this track, we recognize that we need to have a lot more focus on open source security, right? We've got a lot of focus on open source software. What about the security? And what I wanted to talk to you about today is a bit about all the different ways that we can contribute into um, open source security. There's lots of options for people from different backgrounds, with different skill sets, and different goals. And at the end of this talk, I will have told you how to change the security, improve it, of every piece of open source software in the world, just by yourself. So a little bit about me um, to give you an idea of why I'm giving this talk. So I've been in for information and IT security as a practitioner for about 22 years now. Um, these days, I'm a senior security advocate for Datadog looking at open source and cloud native and containerization. I've done a number of different activities across the open source security space in the UK. Uh, I helped start the first OWASP Scotland uh, chapter, uh, which ran up in Edinburgh and has been running for quite a while now. Um, and I've also helped to organize the first two B-Sides conferences in Scotland. If you've not heard of B-Sides conferences, I am going to talk a bit more about, about those later on as we go through the talk. Um, as Andy mentioned, I am a CIS benchmark author for Docker and Kubernetes. I've been doing that for about five years now. And I'm a member of Kubernetes, SIG Security, and CNCF, Tag Security. So I've had an opportunity to see how a lot of different people engage with the open source security world and how a lot of different organizations set themselves up to try and improve this world that we work in and live in. Um, also, as mentioned, uh, I do like, live up in Scotland. You might have guessed from all the fact of the organizations I've been involved with. Uh, this is Loch Oil Head in the West Scottish Highlands, which is where I live. And as you can see, it's very nice and pretty when the sun is out. If any of you have ever been to the West Scottish Highlands, you'll know that unfortunately most days it doesn't look like that. You can't actually see the hills at all because it rains. However, I do urge if you get the opportunity to go up when it's not raining, it's, it's a great place to go and visit. Anyway, let's go on with the talk. So when you're looking for your path in open source security, when you are thinking about how do I get involved, what can I participate in, you might think that there is a barrier in your way. And that barrier is the fact that maybe you're not a programmer. You know, we've heard a lot from the earlier speakers about how we need to work on open source security patching, right? We need to fix the code and get it rolled out. So you might think, well, I'm not a developer, I'm not a programmer. Can I actually contribute here? Well, personally, from my own perspective, I'm not a programmer. I can write enough code to kind of work sometimes, but I wouldn't want anyone to rely on it. Um, my degree is actually in accountancy. So it's still possible for people to contribute even when that's not their background at all. There's lots of ways they can do that. So you needn't worry if you're thinking about contributing to open source security. You don't have to concern yourself that you don't have a programming background or maybe you don't have a security background. There's lots of opportunities and ways to contribute and you know, make things better. First thing you might want to do, you might want to contribute to a specific project. Right? Say you have a piece of software you use personally. Say you have a piece of software that your company uses um, and it relies on. And you think, well, it would be nice if we can contribute to the security of this project. Um, there's opportunities there to choose a project. You might just think, well, I want to contribute. I'll go and find a project. And I've got a link later on if that's something that you want to do. Uh, if you do go down this route, so you're thinking, I want to contribute and I want to help improve open source security, what I would urge people to do is take a bit of time to look at how that project organizes itself. Look at where they congregate. Is it Slack? Is it Discord? Is it a forum? Spend a bit of time getting to know the community. Um, and then look at what sort of contributions they might be interested in. The reason I kind of bring this topic up, I've seen quite a few people who are very enthusiastic, and they kind of come in, and they make a big first contribution without perhaps doing that. And this leads to frustration, both on the parts of the maintainers of the project and of the contributor because it's maybe not what they were looking for in the right format, contributed in the right way. It may not be an area they want to look at. So you get this frustration. So what I would urge everyone to do if they're considering contributing to open source security uh, on a project is just take that time to make sure you're lining up with how they do things. So that will definitely help and kind of smooth the ways, make your first contribution easy. So once you've thought, 
I want to um, I want to contribute to a project. What sort of things might you be doing? Well, and I'm, not, I'm not obviously if you're a developer, then the answer might be writing code. But we're focusing on the non-developer aspect here. So I'm going to say documentation. Um, documentation has had a mention or two in the plenaries, um, but I'm going to emphasize it because it's so important. Uh, there's probably no software, either commercial or open source, that has perfect security documentation or indeed perfect documentation full stop. It's a never ending task. For security, it's critically important that documentation is available. Um, if you're contributing, it could be something as simple as looking at the documentation and saying maybe something's out of date. You know, a simple typo fix or a simple update to a parameter, something quite easy and lightweight to do, can really help a project make, keep things running. Because software moves quickly, open source software moves especially quickly. And when you're thinking about contributing to documentation, it can be something easy to start there. Another alternative that I would definitely, um, I'd recommend people look into is writing getting started guides or getting involved with the getting started guide. If you've ever been to work on a piece of software, the very first thing you do when you start is you go and read the getting started guide and you go down the steps and you install the software. If that getting started guide doesn't take account of security, you might never go back and change those settings. And that's the same for everyone who gets involved in open source. I know I do it. If I get a new piece of software, I go through the getting started guide. Do I go back necessarily, make changes later on? Possibly not, because I don't want to break it. So in terms of documentation, one area I think that could use a lot of focus for many projects is helping out. So you could write a getting started guide with more security in it. You could add little kind of call outs to the getting started guide saying here, you need to make sure when you're going to production, you change this setting or that setting. So there's lots of opportunities for people who are, you know, don't have to be an expert in the project to do that. Another area where I think people can really help contribute is translation of documentation. So we're looking to widen the participation of people in open source. Um, it's helpful if the documentation is available in more than one language. If you're fortunate enough to be bilingual, or maybe even trilingual, you have the opportunity to help by translating from one language to another. It helps people then you know, use that document in secure, documentation in a secure fashion because they can read the translation more easily. So documentation, I think, is a great one to work on. Industry groups, um, Andy mentioned them, I mentioned them. They're really good, they're really important, and they're really easy to get started with. This is all about the different ways and how easy they are. I'm gonna mention industry groups is probably one of the easiest places to get started in open source security. Um, you can just turn up on a Zoom call. Um, the groups I'm involved with, uh, CNCF and uh, Kubernetes Security, they meet bi-weekly or weekly, and you can just literally come along and listen in. That's, all, that's the only level of involvement required. Once you've been there for a while, you will find things need done. There's help that's needed. Um, it's not, again, it's not necessarily, you don't have to be an expert in security to do that. One of the examples we had was there is a, um, there's a cloud native security white paper, the CNCF did, and they recorded an audiobook version. Great, because it helps, again, improve the accessibility of that white paper. All you had to have skill-wise to help with that was the ability to read the white paper and have that audio recorded. We also had a volunteer who luckily had some audio production background and could help us out in actually turning out a nice high quality audio recording. So industry groups are a good place to get started um, involved with open source security to meet people and to get an idea of what kind of work needs done. And you can graduate up through the point where I've seen people move from small contributions all the way up to authoring you know, full documents on areas they, they find are interesting. So it's a good opportunity to kind of like mature there as well. Local meetups, perhaps you like face-to-face -face meetings. Don't we all, actually, you know, after years of not being able to do them, like being able to go places and meet people? And we're very fortunate in the UK now um, that we've got quite a decent range of these. Um, chapter meetings, there's people like OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project. So whilst they call themselves that, they also do things like mobile security and even some cloud native work as well. They've got chapter in London and some other places too. Um, there's other groups like DEF CON, uh, DEF CON have got chapters around the UK and you can meet up then, go, go and meet people there and actually like, you know, have conversations about security. Um, also, if you're thinking about getting into public speaking, I would always recommend starting with local meetups. Start with an OWASP group, a DEF CON group, something where you've got a small friendly audience. It's a great place to get going. We're very fortunate in the UK uh, now to have a good range of community security conferences. Uh, B-sides being one of the most common. So I think I actually looked at it and there are now 10 B-sides conferences, I think, that are either scheduled to run or likely to run this year in the UK. 
because not everyone can get to the big cities, right? We can't all get to, to London or to Edinburgh or wherever else to go to a conference. Uh, and there's various ones. There's one in um, Lancashire. There is one in Leeds this year. There is one in Dundee, I think. Uh, and there's, there's a variety of places where you can go. And this is great because, again, it helps widen participation to people who don't have the luxury of coming maybe to London. Um, in terms of what people can do helping out there, it's not just going along. Conferences always need help. I've never seen a community conference that didn't need more assistance. And that could be in a number of ways, just showing people where rooms are. Maybe you've got graphics design experience, doing logos and t-shirts and things like that. It's always very welcome. So there's lots of opportunities in the local meetup space to actually really kind of like, you know, um, uh, get to grips with open source security and help improving things. There's also, actually, I should mention, because I'll get in trouble if I don't, it's not just B-sides. Uh, there's also SteelCon in Sheffield, which is now, I think, one of the longest running uh, community security conferences in the UK, and Security up in Dundee, uh, which is run by the students of Aberdeen University. And some other ones, which I probably will now get in trouble for not mentioning. There's so many. We, we, the reason I, say, I'm, I want to point this out is when I started in, in, in open source security um, like 13, 14 years ago, there weren't any. Uh, hardly, security conferences. So it's great now to see that's no longer the case. Answering questions. This is another place where people can really have an impact on open source security, and it's maybe not one that gets as much, enough attention. Finding people on a question and answer site who've got a problem and answering their problem can really help. Um, this helps yourself as well, but it's not just a question of, of the altruism of helping someone else. I've done this quite a bit um, with a site called Security Stack Exchange. So you've probably heard of Stack Overflow uh, as the programmer Q&A site. There's actually a network of these Stack Exchange sites which look at different topics and one that focuses purely on security called security.stackexchange. The t-shirt is, is, is one of theirs. Um, helping people out by answering their questions helps them, obviously, but it helps you as well. Or I find it helps me because it makes me think about things. I go, oh, I'd never thought someone would do that. I should now go and read on how it is you do that and what the answer might be. I've also found some great stuff about security and going, really, people use this thing in that way? I would never have thought of that without reading question and answer sites. It's not just security stack exchange, places like Reddit, there's loads of subreddits, uh, and again, questions and answers get answered there. In terms of the impact you can have with this, um, I actually had a little look, stack, stack Overflow was a little impact med metric, they say kind of people reached. I looked at mine for security stack exchange, I had 6.2 million. So potentially, um, some numbers of millions of people have read answers I've given and hopefully been helped by them. So you can have a lot of impact just by answering questions online. Making content. So this is obviously one that, that um, the more we have people doing, the better. Um, and there's a variety of opportunities to make content. This could be a wide variety of different types of content. You know, it could be video, it could be podcasts, it could be TikTok, it could be YouTube, it could be blogs. Blogging is a kind of art that has somewhat died out, which I think is a great shame. I still blog, but the number of people who do sort of writing things down over the years seems to have gone down rather than up, which is a, uh, um, maybe a little bit of a shame. It could be things like maintaining a newsletter on a specific area of security you're interested in. There's all sorts of opportunities. Now, I have, however, picked the logo for this particular slide deliberately. It can feel a bit lonely when you're making content. You write something, you make a video, you do a podcast. Did anyone ever listen to it or watch it? You can't tell most of the time. What I would recommend, and this is the way I do it, is I do stuff that's interesting to me. So I write a blog because I want to you know, write my thoughts down on something. I want to record it. Personally, and this made me be getting old, it means I can come back to it some years down the line and I've forgotten what it was I looked into. I do have blogs of mine I regularly go back to to remind myself of the exact switch or the command I ran. But you're also potentially helping other people because these things are indexed and they will be Googleable or probably now turn, these days turn up as part of ChatGPT's answers to things. Someone's got to generate that original content that these AIs are going to actually synthesize for you and bloggers are some of those people. So there's an opportunity here to do it. And, and you know, I personally, again, do it for yourself, though, is what I would recommend. Because if you do it for the clicks or the audience, it's random. You know, one blog in 20 might get picked up by someone, and some social media thing algorithm runs, and suddenly, you know, it's, it's got a lot of hits. The next 15 might do nothing. Don't rely on the fame. Just do it because it's interesting. And you'll learn something while you're doing it, too. Bug bounties. Maybe you're interested in hacking. Maybe you're interested in the more technical side of things. You like um, really kind of digging into how products work and how you break them. These days, we have open source bug bounties. So people will pay you money if you find a vulnerability in um, 
a specific sets of, of kind of key open source projects. Uh, a good example of this is Kubernetes. Uh, Google have a thing called KCTF, which is if you can break out of a hardened Kubernetes cluster, they'll pay you some tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and so that's another one if you're interested in that. And help you does, but it does help improve open source security, right? These are bugs that are found that people can then patch and fix. And it's, it's, but again, like with my last one, I have picked the logo for the, the picture for this slide quite deliberately. Unfortunately, bug bounties, a little bit of a swamp, perhaps. The reason is there's money involved. So if you've ever, I don't know if everyone here has ever maintained, tried maintaining a bug bounty program. I've talked to people who have. It's not fun. You get a huge number of submissions because there's money involved. And those submissions aren't always the best. So there's a level of essentially, eventually, kind of um, uh, tiredness and you know, going to creep into people who maintain these things. So if you are participating, do have some patience. These people are wading through very large numbers of submissions. It's going to take time. Um, but again, do it for the self-learning. You know, you will learn new things. My approach, my personal approach, I would sometimes do some research. I don't always get a lot of time for it. If I don't find anything, I write a blog. Because I still dug in and found out how something worked, and potentially my blog might then help shortcut someone else's next piece of research. The odd occasion I'll find something useful, and I'll submit it to the bug bounty program and see what happens. But it's an interesting one if you're more technically inclined. So at the start of this talk, I promised you the ability to change the world of open source security, to do something which will impact the security of every single piece of open source software that we use, all the way up to the top of the, top of the mountain. So I'm sure I should try and deliver on that. What is it that I would recommend you can do if that's your goal, if impact is what you want to do? My recommendation, write security standards. I'm afraid it's not glamorous. I'm afraid it's very unglamorous. However, I can demonstrate why I think this is true. So in a previous life, I was a pen tester. I was an ethical hacker. And I would go out every week in the way of the UK industry, and I would test the security of a server or a system. And I would write a report and I would give that report to a customer, and the customer, hopefully, would take what I'd written and implement the fixes. Uh, if I was really, really lucky, they would take what I wrote and implement the fixes across their environment. So realistically, I could probably improve the, the security of up to 50 systems a year, and I'll be honest with you, I was a pen tester for a large number of years, and I did retests, and I would go out the year after, and I would look at the same system and find the same things I found last year. So it's somewhere under 50. In contrast, um, one of the things I've done is I help maintain the CIS benchmarks for Docker and Kubernetes. I can write, uh, in that well under a year, I can write new recommendations into those benchmarks. And every other pen tester in the world and every auditor who looks at that technology, when they don't know the technology, and, and just spoiler alert, most auditors and pen testers don't know every technology they're asked to review, what do they do? They go and look at the CIS benchmark. They get the CIS benchmark down, and they look at it as the recommendations. If you've not come across these before, I should mention they are essentially like a vendor-neutral hardening guide. Um, so obviously, I can then essentially get everyone else to go and you know, implement my recommendations. But it's not just that. Every piece of vulnerability scanning software out there, Nessus, Nexpos, Qualys, all of these commercial solutions, they do configuration guides. Guess what they're based on, mostly? CIS benchmarks. So, you write a CIS benchmark, and you have impact on every one of those. And it's not just that. Every, in the kind of modern cloud native world, we have this kind of type of software, CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management. And if you look at the, what, what are they using to create these um, posture management guidance, you guessed it, CIS benchmark. Last week, um, I'd done a bit of work in the, or we'd done some work in Kubernetes SIG security around RBAC and around how to stop people getting privilege escalation. So I went and added five new sections to the CIS benchmark for Kubernetes. And that will, it'll take a while, it's not going to be quick, but over time that will actually filter out to all these different places. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's great, um, but you know, surely in order to do this, there's some sort of wizened council of people who've been doing this for a long time making these benchmarks up. Turns out no, actually. Uh, you can kind of just go and sign up for the website, and if you've got something where, for example, maybe you've read one and said, that's wrong, that's out of date, that, that recommendation is incorrect, you can just log in and make a recommendation for change. If you're really interested in a product, you can basically go through and help create a new benchmark. When the Kubernetes one got created, none of us knew. This was back in the early days of Kubernetes. None of us knew the best practices. We went through every single setting in Kubernetes that looked security-related and wrote something down. So it's, you don't have to be an expert before you get started in these things. And over time, we've improved it. One of the reasons, another reason um, why I would recommend people to do this is 
bad security benchmarks and bad security standards make people dislike security. Good security standards help, but bad ones actually hinder. Because what will happen is if there's a bad security standard, it has bad recommendations in there that aren't applicable, all the people doing it will hate it, and they'll try and throw it out of the bin, they'll try to avoid it. So time spent in improving these standards, and it's not just CIS benchmarks, but time help improving these standards, or indeed even legislation, we've had quite a lot of people from government here, writing good laws that actually do things as well as possible, and it is hard to do well, no questions asked there, can really help. Another one I was involved in was PCI, who manage all of the um, things to do with card payments, so if you Visa or MasterCard, all the merchants that do that have to comply with PCI. They had some new recommendations or out for container orchestration. So helping to participate in those. I won't promise it's glamorous, and I won't promise it's not maybe a bit boring. You will spend a lot of time in meetings and writing documents. But if impact is your goal, then I would say that that is the best way to achieve it. So in all of this, I have been, you know, there's a question of why. Why would I do this? Why would I go to meetups? Why would I attend conferences? Why would I write a standard? What's in it for the individual. Now, obviously, we're here for open source, right? And part of the answer to that question is altruism. You, a lot of people who help out in open source do it because they want to help out. A lot of people in the open source community that I've worked with, um, they do it because they're interested in it and they want to try and help out, and that's great. But that isn't the only benefit. There are other benefits to help working on open source security. The first one is you're working in the open, right? This is the great thing about open source. Every contribution you make, every document you help author, every meeting you attend will, is visible. And if you're trying to get your, you know, advance your career in security, this is something you can point to that any prospective employer can say, hey, yep, I can see you know what you're doing because you've got these contributions. So that's a good benefit. Also, there's the human aspect of you meet people. You meet people who are involved in this industry and people who can teach you things. I've learned so much from talking to other people when going to meetups or events or working on a benchmark or something like that. Um, so there's an opportunity for learning there as well. And this can, this can really help people's careers. Uh, to give you a couple of real world examples, from Security Stack Exchange days, I know of at least two people who didn't work in security when they started answering questions, but by dint of their con contributions and then some other things they did, like attending and starting to speak at conferences, they were able to move their careers into security, which is where they wanted to go. And they did that through things like an answering questions on, on websites. So it can help there. My own personal thing, I've been approached, I think, three times now. And actually, I've actually got a job because I wrote a blog. Literally, I had someone phone me up and say, hey, we saw you wrote this blog, and now we're interested in talking to you about a job, because you obviously know something about this topic. So there can be benefits. You know, the altruism, I don't think you, you can't rely on it, and I'm not going to promise anyone anything. You know, you can, you can do these things for years, and none of this will happen. But that said, I think there are some additional benefits as well. So um, more information. I have said many things. There are lots of, lots of information about how to contribute to open source and how to contribute to open source security. These are some of the ones that I, you know, in going through, um, mainly around the, the kind of process of getting started. It, it's something you do have to think about, um, but there's lots of good links. These are some of them. And they're ones I would recommend having a look at if it's something you want to do more of. So thank you. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that's given people some ideas of how they can contribute uh, or encourage other people to contribute uh, to open source and some of how the benefits you might get if you did that. I think we have five minutes for questions. Anyone has any questions? I don't have a question. I just want to state the fact that the job that I have is only because of my contribution to open source security, and I got this job. So yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's the true. It, in the pudding. I, I've definitely worked with quite a few people who have, who have managed to you know, either get a job or move ahead through contributing. And I said I wouldn't rely on, I didn't do it for that reason. You know, I've been writing a blog for 18 years now, something like that. And I, I didn't start it with the view of doing anything more than just writing down stuff that might be useful to people. But it can have good effects as well. Um, I did want to just come back. I, I really liked some of the ways to, to like enter and get started with open source. Um, 
I just wanted to comment my own experience. Uh, within CNCF, they've got the really great uh, like language dictionary, essentially, that they're mm. building out, and we're trying to get understand how to translate and do every language possibly. Some of these concepts that were, you know, came up maybe 15 years ago with two people building them, and some of those languages, some of the terms that we use in English-speaking open source don't translate. Um, and I think if you really want to learn, those conversations are incredible spaces to be, because uh, you have to have multilingual conversations about the way technology works in order to redefine it. Um, go and check out the CNCF uh, dictionary and get started for free. You can just join in the Slack. It's very cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean, I'll kind of hold out the other ones I participate in, so I probably would say nice things about them. But both CNCF and, and Kubernetes projects specifically have got a good record of, of encouraging new contributors. I've seen people come in, the Kubernetes project, start from just helping out all the way up to leading a release. I know somebody's actually gone through that whole process to the point of leading a release of Kubernetes. So it's definitely something where you can start off without a lot of background and experience, and people will encourage you and help you and get you to the point where you can do something quite significant. I just wanted to echo the, uh, the aptitude, not experience piece, because I think people who just demonstrate the, uh, their desire to help really, really go a long way. Um, I was also like a, a stack overflow and server fault like addict for, for many years. And when Stack Exchange took the funding and sort of exploded out into all those other sites, um, I, I actually found the inertia of contributing to the security Stack Exchange super high because it was sort of broad and wide and uh, security has more of a sort of technical reliance on absolute correctness, kind of the buck stops there. So I wonder if you had any advice for somebody who would be just looking to get into that um, almost like question answer advisory space as to how to maybe select questions or how they would go about that. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I'd almost say that Security Stack Exchange, I mean, I'd almost say I would answer, if it was me, I would answer security questions not on Security Stack Exchange now, because there are a lot of times things like Stack Overflow, Server Fault, security topics will come up, um, and the same experts aren't necessarily watching. What I typically use tags. So my, my approach now is I have a specific technology interest, which is Kubernetes and Docker, so I have those tags highlighted, and Stack Overflow and all the other sites support that. So you can tag things and then say, I want to search for this tag. So you could say Kubernetes and security. Right? I want to search for everything on Kubernetes and security. And then I look through those, and I see ones where either I know or I'm interested enough to go and like, research the answer. So those, those, I think those good options. But yeah, you're right. It can be tricky. Uh, social media is the other one. I've actually had like, some people who've been quite happy with contributions like um, Docker and Kubernetes subreddits. There's subreddits for everything, though. So you can get you know, all sorts of different places to, to I mean, obviously, with the caveat of it's social media and, and you know, the usual care is needed when contributing to social media. Um, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was uh, extremely interesting, and thanks for all the great open source work you've done. Uh, I uh, concur. Like I got all my jobs through my open source contributions, uh, including my latest one. It is great <laughs> and highly profitable. Um, on the standardization uh, slide you mentioned, I maintain uh, a website which uh, connects standards with each other, and uh, I've done quite a bit of research on how many standards there are. Um, answer is way, way more than you think. Uh, come to my talk tomorrow, you'll find out. <laughs> but why do you think we should make more standards? It's, so in an ideal world, you wouldn't make more standards. But the realistic fact is that different bodies got different goals in life. Um, standards are really hard. Writing, it, the, the higher you get, more abstract you get in standard writing, the more general you have to be, and the less specifics you can make. So there's an element of saying it'd be nice to have something really high level, but then you want something with a bit more technical applicability. I actually, the, the good example is the PCI standard I helped on. We had to remove all product names from that because it was a container orchestration standard, not a Kubernetes standard. So no mention of the word Kubernetes could come into it. And what I ended up doing, because I thought it was a good idea, was I ended up writing 16 blogs to go through all the sections and add Kubernetes specific things back in. So the problem is essentially you, you have this kind of tension between this has to apply across here. Well, if it does that, it can't be anywhere specific enough to give someone the detail they need to implement it. So you end up with that. And then you get special interest groups. Um, health se her the health sector, for example, has got different security goals than the financial sector. So they end up having their own standards. And I, I'm, absolutely, it's not ideal, for sure. But I've never found a good way of like, squaring that circle. 
of saying, how can I make something which is technical enough to allow IT people to implement it, but has the breadth to, to kind of cover all the areas. And I'm one minute over, and I'm conscious. I'm like, oh, no, I won't get to trouble, actually, because there's a break. Any other questions? Feel free to go. We're just eating break time now. So I won't get shouted off. Or I'll be good. Everyone wants the break now. I've mentioned it. Awesome. Yeah. Christoph, thank you.